this meeting of November 17th, 2014 to order. If everyone would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the flag of Michigan and to the state for which it stands, to the beautiful peninsula, united by a righteous seal, for an equal opportunity and justice to all, <laughs> Sandy, could we have the roll call, please? Councilmember Malama, Chippers, here. Spoolman, here. Stevens, here. Mayor Falcons, here. And um, now we need to do the approval of the agenda. But this evening, there's a request to amend the agenda to include an IFT application from Avon Automotive as item B under adoption of ordinances and resolutions. So first of all, we need a motion to amend the agenda. Or can we just make a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Um, I believe you can do that. Oh, let's take the shortcut. Then I'll do that. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Isn't it already on the agenda? Avon protections. Okay. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Shippers? Yes. Bowman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Malma? Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. At this time, we'll open the floor for public comments. We do ask that when you come up to the podium, if you would please write down your name and address. It's very helpful to Sandy when she's putting the minutes together. And if you would also limit your comments to three minutes, we would appreciate that. Good evening, my name is Richie Harris. I live at 124 and a half Air Street here in the city. And I just want to hand this out to you before we get started. I have a copy for everybody. is a letter that I wrote to the paper and they I guess refused to uh, to print it because it didn't have anything to do with the election which I really thought it did and it was a double dare to uh, council members Spoman and Chippers and they were back and they were talking uh, with Mr. Melema about the ethics ordinance and what it says is in attending the Cadillac City Council meeting on October 20th I found interesting that council person Shippers and Spoman agreed that using the city logo without permission for political purpose was a frivolous ethical charge. They also characterized that Councilmember Melema was just being political uh, when he filed his uh, ethics charge against a, a city employee last November, which is the procedure recommended by the city manager and the city attorney. This is one of their reasons for eliminating the ethics ordinance. Here is the double dare for council persons, shippers, and spolemen. You need to run a political advertisement using the Pine River School logo or the MSU Extensions logo for candidate against running against the governor or state representative Poppin. Now remember, you have received no prior authorization to use your com company's logo and are and so doing on company time, also on company equipment. That's the double dare. Your hypocrisy is very evident. Are you ladies and the mayor getting rid of this ethics ordinance because you can't live it up to it? Sure seems that way. Sure seems a lot of good evidence of violations are out there on www.cadillacflashlight.com. Take people a, a chance to go read all of that stuff. Thank you.
My name is Kathleen Mary Williams, and I thank you for letting me have the chance to speak. So I'll get right to the point. The reason for moving, removing the ethics ordinance from our present city rules and codes and so on was explained as being political. Um, I don't see it that, uh, that way. I think the reason that it's wanted to be eliminated is so that um, there is less opposition, which means there's less voice of the people. And when uh, Mrs. Brokens first took the city, she immediately replaced committees that people had served on for months and sometimes perhaps years. And as far as I know, she placed herself as head, and I, that could be wrong, because sometimes I don't hear you very good in here. Uh, I hear it real good when I play it over at home, but not good. Anyway, the next move, uh, after taking these people off committees, because that reduced opposition to what they wanted to do, was to remove the ethics ordinance, which really gives the people are another voice. It's another way of the people having a voice. So uh, there's a little word in the dictionary, and it's called um, dictator. And dictator, according to Webster, is total control. So if you remove the people off the committees and you're in charge of it, that gives you what? Total control. So if you remove the ethics committee, and the people have lesser voice now, again, you're working with total control. So are we going to let um, three people decide to get rid of our city ordinance? It probably needs improved. Are they really allowed to decide for our city of 10,000 people? Or are people just afraid to come forward? So that's all I got to say. Where do I sign? I think it. Where do I sign this? I think Kitty might have picked it up. There you go. I'll put my name on too. Okay. Well, I'm Joe Zakrizik, and uh, I live in uh, Pheasant Ridge. And I'm. <clears throat> I want to uh, talk to the council primarily about boosting up the volume on the microphone. I have a hard time hearing, and like Mrs. Williams, uh, I have to lean forward, and I can't pick up the dialogue at all. So I, I would appreciate if you could. Whoever's in charge of the volume control, perhaps turn up the volume and each member speak into the microphone directly. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, if there is no one else at this time, we'll go ahead and close public comment. The next thing on our agenda is to approve the consent agenda from the regular meeting that was held on October 20th. I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Spoolman? <coughs> yes. Stevens? Yes. Alma? Shippers? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. And then we have a proclamation this evening. And it is a proclamation recognizing December 2nd as Giving Tuesday. And I believe that we have some of the people from the community here responsible for this, if you would like to come forward. No 
now really come forward. Oh, really? <laughs> All right. Wow. Because I'm going to stand here. If you want to turn around and uh, face the audience, would you like to uh, introduce yourself, please? I'm Felicia Garland. I'm the executive director of the Mercy Hospital Cadillac Foundation. I'm Linda Kimball. I'm at the executive director of the Cadillac Area Community Foundation. I'm Pat Goggin, the executive director for United Way. I'm Dan Smith, the executive director of the Cadillac Area YMCA. Before evenings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I have the privilege of reading a proclamation this evening. Proclamation recognizing December 2nd, 2014 as Giving Tuesday. Whereas Giving Tuesday has been established as a national day of giving on the Tuesday following Thanksgiving. And whereas Giving Tuesday is a celebration of philanthropy and volunteerism and a movement that celebrates giving and encourages more, better, and smarter giving during the holiday season. And whereas Giving Tuesday is a day where citizens work together to share commitments, rally for favorite causes, build a stronger community, and think about other people. And whereas it is fitting and proper on Giving Tuesday and on every day to recognize the tremendous impact of philanthropy, volunteerism, and community service in the city of Cadillac. And whereas Giving Tuesday is an opportunity to encourage citizens to serve others throughout this holiday season and during other times of the year. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Carla J. Filkins, Mayor of the City of Cadillac, Michigan, do hereby proclaim December 2nd, 2014 as Giving Tuesday in the City of Cadillac, Michigan, and encourage all citizens to join together to give back to the community in any way that is personally meaningful. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Cadillac, Michigan to be affixed this 17th day of November, 2014. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Attorney. Thank you. I always like this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, this evening we have several public hearings on the agenda, and so we will begin. Um, with the public hearing to consider approval of resolution to adopt ordinance number 2014-10, amending the city zoning map at 1409 Wright Street. Marcus or uh, Jerry? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. I'm gonna introduce Jerry to introduce the item. You good? Thank you. Okay, I'm um, going to give you a capsulated version of the Planning Commission meeting's findings, uh, try to make it quick. Uh, we did place in the Commission packet or Council packet a, uh, uh, a rezoning report, so you've, you've had an opportunity hopefully to look at that. But as indicated tonight, we're looking at a rezoning application. It's for 1409 Wright Street, and uh, the Planning Commission is recommending that that property be rezoned from I-1 Light Industrial uh, to uh, R1 or R2, a one-family residential classification. By the way, the applicants, uh, the applicant and Joni Holly from Coldwell Bank are here tonight too. They represent this uh, particular application, so I'm sure they will correct anything I say incorrectly. <laughs> Let's see if this will work. Ah, here we go. Um, the yellow uh, essentially denotes this is kind of a long linear piece of property. Uh, to the north is Wright Street. To the uh, directly to the west is Leeson. And if we look around at the old Casa Fields around the north, Michigan Bell to the east, Mayberry Apartments, Cornerstone Apartments uh, to the southeast, south, and then basically residential development to the west. So it just kind of gives you a flavor for uh, the property that we're, we're dealing with. 
the applicant is indicated in the application is Pam Park and Robert Jones. I won't read the application. And as mentioned, Ms. Holly is here tonight as well. Uh, she represents the, uh, the applicants. Um, interestingly, this particular site has two classifications. Uh, they're not equally uh, divided, but uh, the northern portion of the site is I-1, and then there's a southern portion that's zoned R-2. Uh, the northern portion is located north of Arthur Street. You'll see a map on this in a second. It's, uh, it's zoned I-1. The southern portion south of Arthur is zoned R-2. And what the applicants are, are looking for is they would like the entire parcel rezoned R-2, one family residential. Uh, again, just another a, a graphic. You'll see the, uh, not sure how well this one shows out. Again, the, the linear uh, piece of property, the yellow block there is the uh, block south of Arthur Street that's zoned R2. Everything north of that is zoned I1. And the issue really comes into play. The green circle that you see, uh, there's a, a residential, single family residential structure located on the site. It's been there for, a, I would imagine, about 50 years, I think based on our record. So it's been there a long time, and that's, that's the issue. Um, uh, that property, as you'll see in a second, it's been for sale for a little over two years at least uh, and has not been sold. Part of the problem is that if you were to go to seek uh, conventional financing for a residential piece of property, it can be difficult to get because uh, under the current zoning ordinance, if that home, for example, were to burn down or to be destroyed, it could not be rebuilt. So that has some, some of the lenders a little bit, bit nervous. Um, just some quick background information. It's frontage on three streets, Wright, Leeson, and Arthur. Uh, as mentioned, the dwelling and the several residential accessory buildings are located on the northern portion. That's the I-1 segment. It was constructed, the home, in 1962. Based on the records uh, we've secured, it's been on the market for well over 800 days and it's not overvalued. We looked at uh, what the property is assessed at and so forth, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's properly valued uh, for a sale. As mentioned, the use uh, of the property, uh, because this is an industrial classification, that home uh, is considered uh, under the ordinance as a major non-conforming use. And again, if it were to be destroyed, it, it can't be reconstructed. So that, as a result, uh, if uh, you have somebody that's interested in a home, they try to get uh, conventional financing for residential purposes, uh, they typically have some, commonly have some issues with that, can't get it. Uh, in terms of adjacent zoning, really in land uses, kind of looked at this already with that one map, but uh, to the north, you have a POS classification, public open space, that's the uh, area, the old Casa Fields owned by the city of Cadillac. Directly to the east, you have a vacant uh, piece of property. I should say vacant, but it's uh, kind of partially used as a storage area for Michigan Bell. To the south, you have single family and multiple family. And to the west, you have one family residential. Um, kind of hard to see this. In terms of some rezoning considerations, some of the things the Planning Commission looked at, uh, first of all, very importantly, it was the historic use of the site. It's been residential for 50 plus years. Uh, without any issues in terms of uh, the particular use and its relationship to, to adjoining uh, uses and adjoining zone districts. Uh, on three sides, uh, it is consistent with uh, the existing residential classification, so the R2 would be consistent, therefore. It's been for sale for a lengthy period at a reasonable price, and uh, uh, there's been no known industrial interest in the property. Uh, the south portion of the site, as noted, is currently zoned uh, residential, so this would clear up that in terms of making it more uniform. They also looked at the fact that the site, due to its physical character, its elongated, narrow, uh, its location and so forth, it's really not conducive uh, to many types of industrial uses. Uh, from the standpoint of being able to accommodate large buildings, uh, being able to accommodate on-site truck circulation and so forth. So uh, it doesn't really lend itself well to industrial development. Um, as required by uh, both local and state law, we did notify all of the property owners and residents within 300 feet of the site. Uh, we also placed a notice in the, uh, the Cadillac News of the hearing. Um, uh, we also commonly, uh, as we do, we place the notice right here at the city offices in case somebody wants to come in and look at it. Those notices were made uh, according to law, and uh, no communications have been received either for or against. We haven't received anything. And I don't believe the city council has received anything either with their notices. Similar notices were uh, 
we're done for this meeting to, or hearing tonight. Um, uh, again, I, these are uh, really summary comments. You have the more full uh, um, treatise in your packet, but uh, essentially uh, what the Planning Commission looked at, uh, looked at was the or is the R2 classification compatible? Is it consistent uh, with the surrounding area, with the property in the surrounding area? Are public facilities and services able to accommodate the proposed land use? And is the rezoning appropriate? Again, went into a lot more depth. Uh, but the Planning Commission, uh, based on a series of findings, and I will read these, I think they're important, they do recommend to the Cadillac City Council that the property be rezoned fully from I-1 light industrial to R-2-1 family residential. And essentially their findings were as follows. The site's character and existing use, location, and anticipated long-term use, uh, viable development potential, and character surrounding development uh, they felt it rendered the R2 classification appropriate. Uh, these factors appear to limit the site's use for industrial purposes, by the way. Secondly, uh, recognition of the primary and historic use of the site and uh, needed and reasonable protection for its rebuilding should it be destroyed. <coughs> Thirdly, the fact that the site has been on the market for an extended period of time uh, at a sale price that is well within true cash value thus indicating that its attraction for use as permitted by the I-1 district may be limited, is limited. Uh, other industries nearby, if, had they wanted to purchase it, they could have. Or if another party was interested, they could have. It hasn't occurred. We also found, or the Planning Commission found, that the demand for industrial properties in the city can reasonably be satisfied fully elsewhere in the city. Uh, nearby, there are several industrial parks that are very close by, much more conducive to industrial development. And so therefore, uh, the city felt that was, or the Planning Commission felt that was an important criteria. Planning Commission felt that the classification is consistent with the zoning and land uses directly north, south, and west of the site. site. Uh, obviously, some issues with the, uh, the industrial to the immediate east, but they didn't uh, feel that that finding was sufficient to warrant uh, a denial or a, a recommendation to deny the uh, zonings. Also, uh, there are additional findings contained within the Planning Commission staff report, which you have, and uh, the fact that at the meeting there were no public comments opposed. There were some in, uh, in support, obviously, from the applicants. And, and so, again, um, no one came out in opposition uh, to the rezoning. The Commission's motion to recommend approval was uh, unanimously approved on a roll call vote. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions or further discussion? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, at this time, we'll go ahead and open um, the floor for public comment as it relates to um, this particular public hearing. I'm Joni Holly. I live at 461 East Cass Street. I am the realtor for this property and we did have an offer for this property and it could not be approved um, by the bank for financing. It was a pre-approved buyer, uh, fully capable of buying a residential property, but because of the zoning, um, they were unable to purchase the property. Seeing no one else, we'll go ahead and close public comment. And then I uh, would ask if there is any further discussion on the part of council. Or Marcus. I just have one comment. Are you the daughter? This is in my ward. I'm familiar with this location, and I want you to know that your father was an amazing gardener, mm -hmm. and you probably know that. Yeah. I miss his big gardens here. We talked about that at the planning commission meeting. Yeah. 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 Do you want to do this thing? Yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution to adopt ordinance number 2014-10 amending the city zoning map for 1409 Wright Street as presented. Support. 
Sandy, could we have the roll call, please? Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Alama? Shippers? Yes. Bowman? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. <coughs> And the next public hearing that we have on our agenda this evening is to consider approval of a request from Avon Protection Systems Incorporated for an industrial facilities tax exemption certificate in the amount of $934,508. Thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. This IFT uh, will help Avon in the in adding an additional 29 positions uh, to um, <clears throat> to Avon Protection Systems here in Cadillac. Uh, there was a briefing um, at our last meeting. The finance director from Avon Protection is here again mm -hmm. this evening. Should there be any additional questions, uh, but we're here to see if uh, there's any public comment. Okay, at this time we will open the floor for uh, any public comment as it relates to this public hearing uh, around Avon Protection Systems Incorporated. Okay, seeing no one, we'll close public comment. Thanks. Uh for bringing that and we always say about doing business in Cadillac it's appreciated and all 29 of those jobs are important that's being added so we appreciate that and I'd like to make a motion that we approve the request as presented from Avon Protection Systems Incorporated in an industrial facilities tax exemption certificate in the amount of $934,508. Support. Before we have a roll call, can I, I'm a little confused and I have a clarifying question, Marcus, about the packet. <clears throat> there was a legal description in there and I, I don't remember seeing this in the information that we received in our previous packet and so I was wondering what this is. It talks about... Where, <clears throat> where, where might you be? I'm just trying to get on the same page as it. Yeah, well, there's no it's page the number. List. It's, it's this, It's Marcus. after the purchase list. It looks like this. Okay. There it is. Yep. Maybe it's just something that's extraneous. I don't know if it's relevant to this discussion. Was there anything changing in regards to the facility um, layout on these streets or? No, I'm wondering if it was somehow inadvertently copied into the packet. It's, um, I think it's just a, I think it's just a clerical error. It's not, it's a different address. I was going to say yeah, it's, it's, it's not 805 West 13th Street. Yeah. It's the railroad stuff. I'll make it on there. Nice, good eye. Well, I have a hard time reading property descriptions anyway, and <laughs> and I looked at those and I didn't remember seeing them before. Um, okay, but it did say um, Cadillac rubber and plastics on it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we all right then? Mm -hmm. Okay, Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Malama. Shippers? Yes. Bowman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Mayor Falcon? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And the next public hearing that we have on the agenda this evening is a public hearing to consider approval of resolution to adopt ordinance number 2014-12 regarding code of ethics. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I have a, a brief slideshow, um, if that's all right, as we enter into the public hearing. Um, it should work. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah, it's on. We tested it earlier. Okay. Uh, how common uh, are ethics ordinances? And looking at, at just putting together some um, general information, I contacted the Michigan Municipal League. Uh, they did a, a, a pretty rough survey um, just online looking at uh, codified ordinances that they were able to get their hands on. Uh, and they were able to uh, advise that there's currently 71 municipalities uh, possessing a formal ethics ordinance, including, including the city of Cadillac. Um, also, it, it is important to note, as I mentioned, it was a pretty um, informal survey. Uh, it's certainly possible that some agencies do have ethics language within their charters uh, and may not have a separate ordinance as well. Some of their codes may not have been available online. But just taking it at face value, 71 uh, municipalities does represent 13% of Michigan cities and villages. Why amend and repeal um, the ethics code? This is simply a short list. Um, implementation of its process, albeit well thought out, is cumbersome in practice. It's certainly controversial. It's been used as a way to personally attack. And it's expensive. Um, we've had six complaints filed within approximately a 12-month time frame, costing an, estima an estimated $21,000. And that's just $21,000 of, of, of cash, not contemplating you know, time spent uh, of staff uh, in, in addition to that. Um, state acts that, that cover ethics. Currently, um, there's the Political Activities of Public Employees Act, uh, Contracts of Public Servants with Public Entities Act, Standard of Conduct for Public Officers and Employees Act, and there's Michigan common law based on judicial precedent as recognized by the Michigan Attorney General. And just taking a, a dive just a little deeper, there's also a host of policies um, that we currently have, and that includes um, within our, our city policy manual, our investment policy, Solicitation of funds using the city's name, outside employment, product endorsement, uh, bidding procedures. Sorry, this is not advancing. If you can hit it, thank you. Um, we also have uh, specific within our police department, uh, and especially um, after the process that they went through several years ago of becoming uh, CALEA accredited, uh, there's a whole host of policies, including uh, bias-free policing, code of conduct, department code of ethics, uh, secondary employment, uh, and general orders and rules um, that all touch upon um, ethics in one in one fashion or another. <coughs> and I missed one. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, um, the Cadillac Oath of Office for elected officials, boards, and commission members. Uh, is certainly something that uh, we hope everyone that, that takes it as they go into office or takes an appointed position uh, do hold close to heart. Uh, and I just wanted to um, sort of start off uh, with, with these few slides uh, moving into the public hearing. As you'll see within the packet this evening as well, um, there is the uh, initial um, ordinance uh, per the council's discussion with respect to um, repealing it in its entirety. Uh, there's also, and if you look at the council communication, uh, it, it draws it out a little bit clearer. Uh, there's also another drafted ordinance uh, that we provided uh, that repeals sections uh, 2-341 through 2-395 in its entirety, and then adopts section 2-396, and, and I'll just read it as follows. Uh, the new section 2-396 includes two, uh, two sections. Section A, uh, employees and elected officials of the city of Cadillac shall comply with all obligations imposed on them by the Political Activities of Public Employees Act, Act 169 of 1976, MCL 15.401 at SEC, 
The Contracts of Public Servants with Public Entities Act, Act 317 of 1968, MCL 15.321 at SEC, and the Standards of Conduct for Public Officers and Employees Act, Act 196 of 1973, MCL 15.341 at SEC. Uh, Section B reads as follows, any employee or elected official who violates any of the statutes identified in paragraph A, that was the paragraph I just read, um, shall be guilty of a misdemeanor which is punishable by a fine of not more than $500 and or imprisonment for not more than 90 days. Um, that documentation, uh, we do have a resolution in the ordinance that would appeal the ordinance in its entirety. This one does a repeal and replacement. Uh, if there were to be um, a concern or allegation of, of, uh, of a law being broken um, that would fall under Section A, uh, it does not prevent anybody from um, contacting uh, a police agency or the, or the um, prosecutor's office and alleging that there's been a, a breach. So that constitutes my introduction. Okay. At this time, we'll open the floor for public comment as it relates to this uh, public hearing in regards to the Code of Ethics. I live at 1241 Warrior Street, and I would like to know what you got um, your 21,000 cost for using the Code of Ethics. How do you come to that figure? Open up. Um, sure. Uh, the $21,000 figure, um, which is basically a, a year to date figure. Uh, constitutes uh, our legal expenses so far in going forward with having various ethics board hearings and other preparation uh, for ethics complaints that we've had. Well, to clear up any misunderstanding, it doesn't cost to file anything with the ethics ordinance. Is that correct or not? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Is it correct that it doesn't cost to file uh, with this? Ethics ordinance? There, there is no cost to the, the party that makes the filing uh, so, to the city, nor would there be a cost in filing it with another agency as well. What is all of this money being charged to? I'm not sure if I'm filing a complaint, there is no cost. If once a complaint has been filed and received, there certainly is a cost by the city in analyzing the complaint and taking it through the process. Well, in view of the facts and things that's happened in the past, um, your own uh, code of honor that you signed when you come in here, a lot of that hasn't been followed. You certainly haven't followed the ethnics ordinance, but you got away with it anyway. You know, you want to get rid of the ethics ordinance, giving us less voice to come forward with. And I don't think it's right. Thank you. Hello, Bill Barnett, 915 Stimson. I was trying to get this on my iPhone, the uh, packet that's tied into this. Hope you're all doing well. I couldn't get that to happen, though, so I wonder if you could check that on your uh, internet site for the iPhones. Uh, there's blame being thrown out here about the ordinance. The ordinance is in a lot of cities. You guys are leaders. I think it was a good thing that our council did, and I'd ask you to not set it aside. I wouldn't blame the ordinance, I would look at the actions. The ordinance is fine, it would work fine, and did work fine for our council. So I'd ask you to, to not do that. It was one of the better things we did as a council, and you'd be setting yourself back. I think Cadillac deserves better 
better than that. The state acts that you're talking about, those are financial contracts and also illegal political activities. Those are already in place. It's kind of uh, ridiculous that you would have to put your own city ordinance in place that's much weaker, that uh, doesn't cover the personal problems that are uh, inherent in conflicts. Case law, common law, those both speak very highly of personal conflict of interest and uh, point those out as problematic. So I wouldn't put in the new ordinance. It's already covered by state law. That's redundant and uh, uh, doesn't make sense. So I wouldn't repeal it. I would look at your own youth council guidelines. They're very clear. Uh, kids are not supposed to be involved on matters that relate to their friends or supporters. That's the ethical level you have kids signing up for. So it would make sense that your own your own behavior and actions would fall under the same sort of uh, situation. So it makes sense to be consistent with adults and kids. I'd ask that you not uh, waste a good step that our city council did by putting this into play. Thank you. I'm uh, Gordy Maxwell from Cadillac, and uh, the, form, the city council had adopted this ordinance unanimously, and it was some time that it was in place before there was any ethics charges brought up, and that happened to be the first charge was against one of the city police officers. And I noticed that that case, uh, the charge came up. Now we're learning that Mr. Homier was uh, uh, asked that one of the council people bring the charge up and uh, that case was handled rather quickly uh, and now other charges are up here and they've pretty much been ignored uh, it seems that you were more than happy to make charges against the other people but when they come before you against yourselves then that's a little different situation uh, if you drop this there will be significantly more expenses. You're already concerned about the expenses that have been occurring to date, but when you drop this ordinance, uh, who would be responsible for the additional expenses that would be, uh, especially legal expenses, that would be coming towards the city because of dropping that? Thank you. nasty weather out there. Bo McCurdy, Cadillac, Michigan, 417 Crestview. Whew, that was a drive. I wish to address the so-called ethics ordinance. This is a high sounding name for what has become a tool for political abuse and wasting taxpayers' money. When former Mayor Barnett lost the last election, it was stated, quote, heads will roll. Keeping that promise, Councilmember Melema brought an ethics complaint against a police officer, an officer whose only sin was to exercise his free speech and oppose the former mayor. And under the guise of this ordinance, you had a hearing that accomplished nothing. Nothing because you knew all along that the ethics ordinance violated the union contract you have with the police. And it's a shame he's not here tonight, but uh, you went ahead anyways. You paid city attorney Homier $18,000 to hold that kangaroo court. All a complete waste of time and money. Now the waste and abuse continues. Supporters of the former mayor continue to file politically motivated claims, all the while spending taxpayer money <coughs> and staff time. 
Now they claim that Mayor Filkins should not have voted on a recent issue, but they ignore the fact that the city attorney, Homier, has given his legal opinion. He advised that the mayor, and in fact the entire council, could vote on the issue. So her opponents are bringing an, an ethics complaint because she followed her city attorney's advice <laughs> and thousands of taxpayer dollars will be wasted on this. Where does this abuse end? Should I or someone else file an ethics complaint against Mr. Stevens when he refused to follow a legal opinion a few weeks ago? How about a complaint against Mr. Melema for his childish actions in walking out of the council meeting a month ago? Or a complaint against Mr. Melema for voting and, atten and attending closed meetings for years on a high profile lawsuit and then later deciding that he had a conflict of interest. No, you know, enough. No more. It's time to end this. And the only way to do this is to repeal this ill thought out, abused and misused ordinance. We the taxpayers value the time and money it takes to deal with these unfounded complaints. The city has important things to do. The taxpayers have spent far too much on malicious, vindictive lawsuits and hearings. The votes were cast. The people are tired of the vindictive bullying. The ethics ordinance is being used for political purposes and it needs to be repealed. Mr. Melema, Mr. Stevens, it's time to move on. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Mike Benjelink, Cherry Grove Township. Um, I'm here not to discuss the, the ordinance per se. It's my understanding the root cause of the ordinance uh, Due to the ordinance, root cause of the lawsuits, I guess, right now that are against the mayor and possibly the attorney have to do with a vote they took about the Jim Blackburn case. The Jim Blackburn case was brought because he was accused of being an officer or participating directly with Mrs. Filkins' campaign. I was Mrs. Filkins' treasurer both when she ran and lost and when she ran and won. If anybody would like to go to the courthouse, they'll find the organizational statement, which shows Mrs. Filkins as a candidate, myself as a treasurer, myself as a record keeper, period. Nobody else through either one of the elections were on any committee of any kind. Mr. Blackburn was a verbal supporter of Mrs. Filkins. Mr. Blackburn never donated to Mrs. Filkins. That also was available at the courthouse. Why Mrs. Filkins would have any conflict voting on that case is beyond me. Thank you. Okay. Richie Harris, and I'm back again. I guess. I don't understand, um, like I said before, back in May when I wrote the public opinion, um, not all of us are on a vendetta. You know, some of us do other things, and unfortunately I have a lot of free time and I've really dug into a lot of this. And I handed you a letter earlier, and it also contained part of what I filed as the ethics. And this is something that really bothered me is that uh, Mr. Wotilla had uh, passed a letter to the prosecuting attorney that he didn't represent, nor did Mr. Homer represent Mayor Filkins, but yet he sure did intervene and interject that boy so forth that uh, there were many questions about the petition and he went on and on and on and, and um, from the depositions that I have seen, um, 
it just really makes me wonder that you know why we get why are we getting back we asked that you know four of you council members well three of you are here that voted you know to put this in place and now you want to wash your hands of it are you saying that you've gave up and you're not you're not ethical anymore come on now i know better than that i guess i just don't understand that uh you know i read this letter and it just it really bothers me that why Mr. Wotilla would meddle in the background of the whole scenario when he wasn't representing anybody, but yet it was all to the mayor's defense. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one else, we will close the public comment portion of the hearing. And I guess I would like the opportunity to give each council member an opportunity to put their thoughts out. Council member Stevens, I'm gonna start with you. No surprise there. Um, I'll start if you don't want to. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I, I keep going back to that email. I know I referenced it. Uh, it was the day after our first meeting in October. I wasn't at that meeting, but we had the uh, email that came to all of us um, from a well-respected citizen. He seemed to he seems to be calling this correctly that now is not the time, um, and he's mentioned about the division it causes and such. And uh, I keep going back to that email, and I remember referencing that last meeting as well that um, I think his guidance made sense. And I, I hope we consider that. I, I, again, I wasn't at the meeting when it was proposed and that discussion occurred. But a reason that I would agree with him, I don't think he addressed this in his email, but we serve as judges in that role. It eventually comes back to us and we serve as a judicial just like we would as an appeals court. We had a open, at that time we had an open, not to my knowledge, but in the while well, I was gone from that meeting that same day or the day before we had an open case brought to us. And then we as judges um, were kind of critical of the person bringing it before us as we're serving as judges, why we have an open case. And that, I look at that as comparable to, say, Judge Fagerman at a pretrial hearing saying, you know, I'm gonna set the hearing for this date, but by golly, this so-and-so is evil and it's a waste of money and a waste of our time. It's just not good timing to address it when you have an open case. Or the judge speaking at a dinner meeting and, and talking about a case that's open saying these idiots have have done this um, last February I after the first ethics not during that hearing not during any of that process but after it was completed I did address to this council that we should amend some items and it, I think it was apparent to all of us that amending it makes sense a, a lot of sense. Um, we didn't do anything with it while we didn't have a case open. And, and I could see us looking at amending it and making changes to it and sitting down like we've done other ordinances and really research it and see how do other communities do this and how did they work successfully why is it that the Michigan Municipal League has a handbook encouraging this um, and how it works in those communities? Uh, I do agree it needs to be amended. But as I said, I brought that up last February, that changes need to be made. And I do think when we don't have an open case, because right now part of it is we just tainted whatever that situation was in the public eye. We tainted it because the judges made a decision towards one of the people before we heard it or before it was to the board that 
the judges actually have contracting abilities for their jobs. And I just caution that, that the timing of this is not, is not good when we have an open case and we're amending something. Um, I agree, we need to make changes. I've said that about the very first one that we had last year with an employee. And we totally need to change that with employees. But yet the contradiction is I've been over here saying we made a mistake with that employee. We should have stopped it and gone on. We're telling everybody the problems the ethics are in this, but we're still fighting that employee in a grievance, in another act, and we're letting it go on. We're publicly insulting that this ethics thing happened. We spent 18000 but the public needs to know that this council by a majority is still fighting that employee. So to say the Ethics Act was wrong, why are we then spending all this money after fighting them? And they still have something tomorrow on the same case. We've let that happen. So I, I don't know if the action, I don't think the problem's the, <laughs> there's multiple problems. Repealing it's not gonna change it. We just stated it could go to the, the actions would still happen, but just at a different level. Then it's at a prosecutor or the police departments. But what I really like to see us do is, like I brought up last February, is get together and do some sessions of revamping this ethics ordinance. Thank, Thank you. you. Sherry? Council Member Spoman. I um, am conflicted with this, and I can see all sides of it. You know, I think conceptually an ethics ordinance was a good thing. And we moved forward as a council and said, yep, we want to have an ethics ordinance, a, something that would guide our behavior and guide officials within the city's behavior. And what was mentioned in public comment is that it worked for a while, and it did, until there was started to be some behavior that people started to question. And, and now, we're using this in just some really bizarre ways. And the question was asked, you know, why is it costing so much money? Because of the way this is written and the way that we have to operationalize it, we are required to respond in a certain way. Every time we have an ethics ordinance violation brought before us, and we've had at least six of those this year. I don't know if that includes the two that we just received on Friday. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, you know, we keep stumbling and we can't get past first base. I don't think we're being unethical. And I don't think our behavior is unethical. When you look at the ethics ordinance, it really addresses things like conflict of interest, and the conflict of interest that we're talking about here really talks about conflict of interest and whether or not, you know, if we approve a contract or something, one of us is going to make some money off of it. Business transactions, incompatibility, negotiation of contracts, use of city property and resources, nepotism, gifts, and so on. And, and I don't think any of the complaints have really focused on any of those. You know, so they focus on a lot of other behavior that is really hard to define, and you do need a judge. You need to be the judge and the jury, or the committee needs to be the judge. 
and um, and then we start to talk about well who should be on that committee and whether or not there's a conflict of interest so it gets really convoluted really fast and it is taking up a huge amount of our resources to try to operationalize this but I can understand everybody's perspective and I, I don't think we're not being ethical by Repealing and I don't like repealing ordinances. I would be more in favor of amending it But if I had you know if I had to go on one side of the fence or the other I would I would repeal it just because it's not working Unfortunately, and you know we, we put a lot of effort into this and we've heard about other municipalities where it's not working because of the same sort of thing. I think it might be working in municipalities where there haven't been those issues. As a community, we're just having a really hard time getting past the last election and the things that happened at the last election. I mean, that's the bottom line here. Thank you. So I don't see any issue at all with the things spelled out in the ethics ordinance. The issue is in the process for filing a complaint. Now, even Council Member Spullman, when she said that we've had these ethics violations, that's what's happening, is these are allegations that, first of all, let me make it very clear, that if you don't agree with what somebody does, it does not violate the law. If you disagree with what somebody's choice is, and it does not violate what is stated in the ordinance, it is not an ethics violation. What we have been seeing coming towards us are time and time again complaints that are then called ethics violations. And here's the process, okay? First of all, the paper comes to the city desk here. And then a copy goes to the paper. This is what's been happening. What's the motivation there? Is it to be ethical or is it to stir up a bunch of stink and create a, a trail of ethics violations when the only one that was found was not what was stated in the charge, which was using the logo, but was using city property for personal or political activity and using city property for political activity is does not violate the ethics ordinance it violates federal law so this was this is redundant now here's the problem if you don't like the fact that i was elected or you don't like what i think or what i say you can come down here and file an ethics violation charge walk over to the paper, and it is guilt by accusation, plain and simple. And in this ordinance, we have established a system to investigate and to mediate these charges or complaints. And now what is happening is that the, the, the system that we put in place, and excuse me for getting so indignant, but this is a pile of you know what, not this but how it is being abused, shame on you. And, and, and I have to tell you that when I said beware of laws, and that when you make laws, beware of how they will be used in the hands of evil men, I was not speaking of any individual. I was making the point that when you make a law, there will be unforeseen consequences. And the unforeseen consequences right now is that anybody can with impunity, one after another, come in and put a piece of paper on that desk, walk across the street to the paper and say, this is an ethics violation. You want to know what's an ethics violation? Doing that, if you ask me. It doesn't violate our law because you're not under this law. It is for those of us who have been elected by the majority of people in this community to make these decisions. So yes, we have to decide this. You elected us to do this. Now, I spent last weekend, and I'm getting all, with my father. My father is a, he's 85 years old. 
He is a lifelong attorney. He still works full time in the city of Chicago. He was Bobby Kennedy's first assistant for organized crime in the 60s. He's the guy who came up with the idea to use immunity against the mafia, and it worked. He was also the chief judicial um, counsel for the House Judiciary Committee under the Clinton impeachment. He wrote the articles of impeachment when Clinton was impeached in the House of Representatives. That's my father. And I said to him, he's been my mentor and he has been my inspiration for public service my entire life. And I told him what's going on in our community. And I will not repeat the specific words that he said because we are on television. But he said, these people are using this as a weapon against the very people who they elected, who said, who raised their hand and said, I am going to behave ethically. I am going to do what I believe is right in my community. So when, when, when Kitty asked, it doesn't cost anything to file, it doesn't cost you any money to file. What it costs is what's happening in our community. And maybe it should cost something to file. And this was my father's idea. He said, here, let's amend. Maybe if you just amend it, here's a really good amendment. So to remove, ugh, this just makes me so upset. Well, here's what he said. Complaints alleging a violation of this article may be filed by any citizen. All charges filed shall be fully investigated by those designated by the city to investigate said charge. If at the close of that investigation it is determined that the allegation was unfounded, that means it did not violate the ordinance, then the city shall be reimbursed by the charging party for the entire cost of the investigation, including all attorney's fees incurred including all man hours for the people who have spent their time investigating these charges. So you will pay that back. Furthermore, if the investigation concludes the false charges were filed maliciously or for political purposes, the charging party may sub su be subject to a fine up to $500 plus, plus the individual charged shall be entitled to file a civil suit for libel and slander and recover all attorney fees and costs incurred in defending said false charge. So if we want to amend it, let's amend it. If we want to repeal it and replace it, then let's do that. Let's replace it with, with a system that makes the people dropping a piece of paper off here and then at the, at the paper accountable for their actions. The end. Thank you. I've listened to what everyone has had to say this evening, and I've been giving this a lot of thought. I, I tend to remain quiet as it relates to this topic, but this is a perfect example of why I ever stepped out and wanted to serve in the city of Cadillac. This type of behavior that's going on in our community right now, and we're using this tool, that's what it is, it's a tool, um, to, to make a point for whatever point um, is trying to be made, we're using a tool that we put in place and are making it possible. I respect everyone's opinion. You know, I've always learned that, um, you know, whether it's in my work or whether it's my, whether it's my, ch whether it's with my children uh, or my spouse, perception is reality. And we all hear different things from different people and we make our choices and, and we decide the path that we're going to take. You know, Mr. Barnett stood up in this chambers this evening and he talked about our youth council. We have an opportunity in Cadillac
to lead by example with a wonderful group of students and to teach them what city government can be all about. <coughs> and that's not, this is not what city government should be all about. I would be ashamed to have those same students listening to this conversation. There is so much bullying that continues to go on in this community, and why? You hear of tragedies in people's families where they lose people they love or people in the community that they love. We don't know if we have tomorrow. You have today to make a difference. Maybe you only have today to make a difference. And if, if everyone were to take all of this negative energy and actually volunteer on some of the boards, we have, we have right now 13 openings on boards within the city alone where you can make a difference, a positive difference. If you want a voice and you want to be heard, volunteer your time to work with one of those committees. And I'm sure that the same is true at the county and the township level. But to continue with this type of behavior, and it is bullying, it's, it's nothing other than bullying, and I'm not going to be bullied. So we have a couple of options, I think, um, that were presented to us by staff. Um, there could be one of two motions, depending on how you feel after all of this discussion and what our audience had to say this evening. The first one could be a motion to approve the resolution adopting the ordinance to repeal the City of Cadillac Code of Ethics and adopt the new Section 2-396 or a second motion could be to approve the resolution adopting ordinance to repeal the City of Cadillac Code of Ethics. I have a clarifying question. Okay. Um, if we repealed sections 2-341 through 2-395 and inserted section 2-396, what would it look like? I don't have it. The um, the language itself, Councilman, or the uh, you know. Yes, it's here. That's the whole thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Where is that? It's right in this. It's in, if I may, it's in the council communication. Right, but that just shows me. There's also a copy of the ordinance as well within the packet. The packet and right here, both, sure. Both the ordinances. <coughs> Can there be? Um, Burn. This is the entire ordinance, then. Yes. That's what I thought. Can there be a third option? Sorry. That um, to follow we, your father's plan. Yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, that we. I think what has to happen first is that that we repeal this, replace it with this suggestion right here with this so that there is something in place and then bring this to committee or to something to look at if we want to what if there's anything from here we want to reinclude or if there's anything that because I have not I have not looked at these statutes and compared them with things here and see if there's something that that we that is not in those statutes here. That's my fault because I didn't look them up. I didn't have time to do that. But um, if there's something that we need to add to this to keep those kinds of personal, I don't know, do we want to keep those personal things in, involved in it? But if there's something else. Well, we, we, like had asked, we had asked uh, Mr. Homier to um, go out and to do the homework, if you will, or the research, and make sure that all of that was in there. Do you feel like that's as all-inclusive as Council Member Shippers is looking for? Yeah, well, 
let me just go through the options, right? The first is just a repeal. That doesn't prevent the city then from enacting in the future some replacement version once you come to that point, or enacting the second option, um, which is a repeal and replace, listing those acts that you must um, adhere to, which you know I think that <coughs> generally speaking you have to anyways under state law. So, and then taking it from there and assigning it to a committee and coming back with a future amendment or a future um, ordinance that you would like to consider. There's nothing that prohibits you doing either of those. Clearly what we have is not serving its purpose. Um, so I think that option A needs to be part of it. Whether we want to replace it with this so we have something still on a, a placeholder on the books that does have some local teeth, you know, does have a local uh, consequence for the state statutes. Um, And then we can, as you said, always amend that as we see fit. All right. So okay. is, where is the um, the part about gifts? Where, what would rule that? Is there a... That's in the state. <clears throat> yeah. I think um, there's a, um, a policy that the city currently has already regarding gifts. So you have a policy that applies to that. There are a number of these things that are covered, frankly, under both, both your employee manual, employee policy, and, um, and the now existing ethics ordinance. So there's some overlap there. So the use the, of... The city, the city, as far as I know, prior to this ethics ordinance had existed or had gone 30 some years mm -hmm. with no problems that, mm -hmm. that I could find. Mm -hmm. And now it's become a big problem. And it puts everybody, everybody that works at the city at risk for the same thing happening. Say somebody gets upset with their their water bill and comes in and starts filing an ethics violation against Jeff or somebody isn't happy with um, how quickly election results came out and so they file against Sandy or anybody else, Fran at the front desk. She's being unethical because she didn't do what I wanted her to do when I wanted her to do it. It puts all of us, not just your elected people, it puts everybody at the mercy of anyone who doesn't like what they do. That has nothing to do with being ethical or not ethical. It's not unethical to disagree about things for crying out loud. Oh, and that logo thing, that double dare, Sherry couldn't um, use the logo, but I'm the union president at Pine River and we have the Bucks logo on our letterhead. And that logo was on a letterhead. And then that letter was put in the ad. I don't believe that Lieutenant Golnick put the ad in the paper. The letter was sent to the committee as a letter of endorsement. And I, as a union president, send letters of endorsement with our letterhead, which includes the Buck. So, and, it, and that's not unethical. We are the Pine River Area Education Association. We are associated with Pine River. So, there is that. Okay. So, is someone comfortable making a motion? 
Well, I don't think comfortable is the word. Well, but okay. Is some I will make a motion. <laughs> I don't think anybody's comfortable with this conversation. I'm not afraid to. Um, I would like to make a motion to. Let's see, where's the one? Let's see, to. It's at the bottom of the page. Yeah. To approve the resolution adopting the ordinance to repeal the City of Cadillac Code of Ethics and adopt new section 2 396. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have support? Support. So, just in a discussion point, so you put that section in. Are you saying then if somebody, they're still going to have to, if you put it in a city ordinance, they're still going to have to go through a city, if it's a state law and then a city law, they're going to, they're going to get it twice? I believe that it, with that in there, if somebody felt like there was something going on, then they have the right to go to the police department and say something's wrong so really or to like the prosecutor. Right. So if it's, it's basically there or not. They have the same right. This is really repealing the ethics ordinance because with that there or not, that person could do that. That's true. Yeah. So it's really repealing it. It's just putting <coughs> nice it's leaving an ethics ordinance in place so people so that we can add and if something is not covered there that you want to have covered, then we can we can add that. Maybe you'd like to be on a committee to look at. I don't know if you'd want me on that committee, but um, I will say this. What, what did happen tonight was exactly my point made at the beginning. That, and, and I, the difference is, it's not really, we do, in this case, if you look at this, we serve as the judicial section. We're, we're making a <coughs> decision. And, and I think most people watching this, if, if we put a bet, most people would say they know how the any of these ordinances or these uh, complaints coming forward you might have just well called that tonight we have open cases before us and we just made judges judgments before now to me people can say it's bad or what and it's art but the point is, is i said this months ago before any of this came up the, <laughs> We're, that's what's making this a mockery is we got open cases and maybe I've worked too too much in the judicial system and such to know that it's not the time to do this we just told the public those cases rulings that will save money where the legal cost is how we have this established we have a member on the ethics committee that's also the attorney that that's where the time comes in too we could probably save the money because I think there was just a ruling on five cases before we even had the hearings. And then this same group hires two of the people on the ethics committee that we could hire and fire them. We've just made a decision that they're thinking, man, we better not go forward there. So I still have a problem with our timing on this. I, I, it's amazing how that email, go back and read that October 7th email. Um, that and, and watch how exactly how he said this was going to turn out. Who was it if from? I, Why are you speaking cryptically about it? I don't. Well, because I, can't I didn't. Remember what email I got on October seventh? I didn't want to publicly give the gentleman's name, but uh, we'll call him John. Yeah, that's a good. But the point is, is it, it's exactly how this has turned out. The thing is, is that if we um, wait until there are no more allegations coming we'll forward, never, we'll never it'll happen. never happen. But I, because I, that's, the, I believe that that the I, I just, yeah. Well, whatever. Okay, we need to. We'll well, just we do vote. need to vote. But the last I irony on this, to me, is we're talking about how bad this is. We're talking about a specific case, and I go back to the point, for months I've been saying we're dealing with our employees wrong. We have a case with an employee. I've said this for months. You guys are yelling and screaming about this ethics thing, but yet we, have, we never stopped it. We've allowed it to go on and it's still going on. That's the irony of this whole thing. We should be, if we're gonna do this, 
there should have been a strong message to say we needed to stop what we've been wasting time with on this grievance and the other one and just have ended it. But we're still going to fight that and spend legal on this, yet we're over here saying that everything that was done, I don't see that. Uh, there's a lot of irony in that. There, there is a lot of irony, and, and I'm, I'm not going to bring up some of what that irony is because I think all of us sitting here know what that is. Um, but I think that we should take it to a vote and move on. So, Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Shippers? Yes. Bowman? Yes. Stevens? No. Malama? Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, our next public hearing is to consider approval of a resolution to adopt, adopt ordinance number 2014. Dash 13 regarding snow and ice removal. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Sandy, will you get a sec? You can. Sure. <clears throat> um, to introduce uh, this item this evening, we have a, a, a brief slideshow. Um, a little bit. This is again the public hearing with respect to <coughs> consideration of removing a section of our uh, uh, ordinance dealing with sidewalks uh, in the winter, snow and ice uh, removal of sidewalks in the winter. Uh, the um, uh, title here, uh, you know, walkable, safe sidewalks are important to everyone. Please make the effort to keep your sidewalks clear this winter. Uh, basically, rolls the theme out, uh, generally speaking. Uh, with respect to uh, what we're asking of our community. Uh, it's definitely um, a team approach. Uh, sidewalk snow and, and ice removal activities. Um, the proposed ordinance change uh, under section 36-77 is what's before us this evening. Uh, we've also uh, prepared uh, a snow um, uh, and ice removal public communications program and within your packets uh, you have um, uh, that information. Uh, we sent, I sent it out last week, but it also is in the public packet as well. Uh, as a part of that, um, we're also looking at a um, communication schedule, uh, frequently asked questions, uh, and certainly as sort of a follow-up to all of this, we'll be, we'll be talking about it internally, uh, evaluating how, it, um, how it's working, how, how we can try to improve, uh, and how we can move forward. Uh, part of what we're really trying to do different this year than in years past is to uh, really communicate uh, more often, more frequently with, with our community, uh, both our residents and our um, property owners, businesses alike. So the proposed ordinance change, it's, it's rather brief. I'm going to read it again for the public record here. Uh, section 36-77, snow and ice removal. Um, A, the occupant of any premise or the owner of any unoccupied premises is required to keep the sidewalks in front of or adjacent to such premises cleared so far as is practical and reasonable from snow and ice to facilitate pedestrian use. The following statement is what we're proposing that we strike, where the continuity of a sidewalk is interrupted between properties within a block or between blocks, the abutting property owners shall clean a path free from snow and ice where a sidewalk would otherwise be to facilitate pedestrian use. And so as we're looking at working with our community uh, closer this year as we as we perhaps not done in years past, we're actually looking at reducing the burden with respect to um, requirements under the under the proposed ordinance change. Um, the following is a, a picture uh, here in town of what exactly we're referring to uh, with respect to the, the ordinance change. And so here you can see how the sidewalk continuity is interrupted. Uh, you can see in the, sort of in the background uh, a sidewalk, uh, the arrow is pointing, and thank you Jerry very much for sticking the arrow there, that really helps. Uh, the arrow is pointing to, uh, to someone's front yard, uh, and then you can see a driveway, and then I believe the sidewalk may possibly pick up again. but. Under the ordinance as it's currently written, we would be requiring folks to actually uh, clear uh, snow and ice from the unpaved areas. 
this is another image, uh, and this actually shows three locations uh, where uh, the, there's lack of continuity. Uh, if you look at the screen closest to where the city clerk is, uh, the green dot indicates uh, where the sidewalk is to the north. Uh, just to the east, that's the uh, football field. Uh, this long line here represents, or I shouldn't say represents, but is the fence. So the sidewalk stops here. It's all grass. There's then a sidewalk here off of Chestnut and Linden uh, across the street. There is no sidewalk. Again, it ends uh, just to the east of Linden. Uh, likewise, uh, further to the north, there is a sidewalk on the west side of the street. Uh, and then again, it stops. And so here's an aerial that indicates three uh, different locations um, of, of where, with the ordinance uh, amended, we would basically not require um, people to maintain or to clear uh, snow and ice from those areas. Uh, some of the highlights of the communications program um, that is listed within the agenda include news releases. Uh, we've developed frequently asked questions uh, that will be a part of the news release. Uh, we'll, we're also going to be able to put it online, put it in uh, a variety of other uh, media, uh, including our website, our Facebook. Uh, there's already been some special flyers uh, that have gone out. Uh, there's the downtown newsletter. Uh, they've already received a snow removal fire. Uh, we're looking at having uh, information put in our utility bills that will be out in December, uh, and certainly other flyers for general distri distribution as well. Um, you know, if you look at and you focus on the, uh, on the strategy itself, what we're really trying to do is, is hit it in several different areas, several, di several different times over the course of the winter season. Um, you know, there's the different media attempts where we're looking at disseminating the information again through a variety of different different resources. We're looking at targeting different groups, groups such as our uh, our downtown merchants. Uh, the entire city gets canvassed when it goes in the utility bills. When it goes on Facebook, that's another different target audience, folks that are using social media to get their information. Um, and so we're really looking at trying to, to connect with as many people as we can. And then lastly, just uh, uh, to mention again that we'll certainly be conducting um, uh, conversations internally with staff that are involved with the program uh, to see how it's going. Uh, you know, we all know we got hit uh, recently with snow and there have been some calls already that have come in about making sure that the city uh, hits our own areas uh, and we do ask for people to help um, without question you know we are able to get out there with our machinery uh, and open up the sidewalks but our ability of clearing the sidewalks that truly make it uh, pedestrian um, accessible is just it, it's just simply not there it, it requires the assistance from our community to get out there and to, to really open up the walk uh, the walkways to salt them uh, and to get them as cleared as possible. Um, the services that we provide, and we're very happy and proud to do it, we, we believe we do a good job in doing it, um, really helps when you get a major dumping of snow, a major accumulation of snow. We're able to get in there um, with our uh, V plow and open them up, and then when the snow does get very heavy and wet, we're able to get in there with, um, uh, with a snowblower to help. Uh, to help blow it out, but it's it's still not going to be the same as someone else coming out and kind of helping with the day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance uh, of the um, of the program. So you know, again, back to where we're at um, uh, this evening um, with respect to the ordinance uh, amendment. We are looking at um, essentially cleaning the ordinance up a little bit and reducing the. Uh, a requirement with respect to areas that are uh, in between sidewalks that are currently not paved or landscaped. Can I, completes my can I ask a question or do we have to wait till after people say something? We probably should wait. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pacha. At this time, we'll open the uh, public comment as it relates to this public hearing. 
uh, regarding snow removal. Again, Bill Barnett. Um, a couple things. On the last slide had the word everyone. Hello, Marcus. The last slide had everyone on it. And uh, if you want a walkable community, I think you'd want to have uh, either sidewalks or paths everywhere for everybody. You shouldn't pick and choose winners and losers. I think the the, if the council doesn't repeal the, this ordinance. This is the one to repeal. It's never been enforced. Really, I mean, I'd ask you to look and see if you have one enforcement ever, so I'm not aware of it ever being enforced. It's on the books, never enforced, get rid of it. That was the good direction that our city council went last year. Uh, we decided to invest in a sidewalk plow. I'd invest in another one if I were you and get rid of this ordinance and do what used to be done in the 60s, which a Jeep. See Mr. Shanklin in the house. I think he was back there at that time, but uh, many of us have been around. Uh, but at that point, we had a little Jeep go around town, and it did all the sidewalks. You know, it zipped through, and uh, seniors weren't required to do their sidewalks and have to worry about tickets. I, th I see that's where this is going. There's no other reason why you would tweak this uh, ordinance that you've never enforced. So let's get out the whole truth here, uh, or the accurate agenda, which is to enforce sidewalk plowing or shoveling, as it were. Uh, I just think you're going the wrong direction. We spent good money to go a different direction. Just uh, you could finish it tonight and go, keep going by repealing it. So I'm curious why now, and if you could explain why we're doing this now. I know in March there was a directive to uh, create a system of tickets and enforcement, and it looks like this is what it is. If it is, please let us know. But it would be treating citizens unequally. I know you don't want to do that. If you want a walkable community, it should be walkable for everybody, not just certain neighborhoods. And uh, I hope it's not perceived as bullying to come to public comment and make statements, or that it's political, because it's not. I think people have First Amendment rights, and they shouldn't be squeezed out because of who they are. And legitimate criticism of public officials, like myself, went on for 18 years. Not once did I pull out the bully word to try to change the direction of, of what the issue is. So keep track of what the real issue is and try to be straight with our citizens. Thanks. Good evening. Randy Lindell, City Cadillac. Um, I'd just like to expound on the the new ordinance uh, we sh we should get rid of it or uh, not repeal it at all leave it as is uh, we need snow s uh, sidewalk removal uh, with the purchase of the new sidewalk plow uh, hopefully a solution was found to alleviate the problem uh, I can see that we're going to continue to have a problem with that so uh, hopefully we'll continue this uh, <coughs> the citizens of Cadillac need it uh, here we are, you know, early winter. I know it's going to cost money, but for everybody, uh, for a win-win situation, uh, let's continue this and not repeal it, and let's have the sidewalk removal, s snow, continue. Thank you. Bob Shanklin, Howard Street, Cadillac, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to clean my own sidewalks, and I do think they're important. And uh, I think the city has done it historically forever, and um, I don't see enforcement as being very practical because the bottom line is they do need to be cleared, and uh, enforcement is going to be a delay. And I do walk a lot, and um, I can walk in the street. The street department does a fine job. They do the streets well. They do the alleys well. Uh, there's a delay in getting the sidewalks done. And if it's a matter of manpower or overtime, uh, that is what I would suggest. If uh, uh, we've got the equipment, uh, and I realize that takes money, but uh, it needs to be done and do needs to be done in a timely manner. <coughs> Excuse me, timely manner. Uh, um, on side streets that aren't busy, you can walk in the street. 
on a busy street such as Cass Street, you uh, if you walk, you walk the sidewalk. You know, last year, and it was an exceptional winter, uh, it was a, a chore for someone like myself, let alone uh, the mailman that had to walk it every day. And But anyway, uh, they, they need to be done. They need to be done in a timely manner. I don't know what it takes as far as the, the ordinance goes, but uh, enforcement I see as a delayed process that, bottom line, wouldn't get the sidewalks cleared. So I, the city, is, to me, has set a precedent that ordinance has been there for a lot of years, and uh, but we continue to clear them. But it seems like it's become a slower process. So I think we got equipment. I think we need the manpower, uh, allocate the funds, or whatever it takes. Thank you. <coughs> Name is Terry Harvey, Cadillac, Michigan. Um, I've been in the snow removal business for about, well, actually, couple years, over 35 years probably. <clears throat> and uh, there are a lot of people clean their sidewalks that are able to clean them or have the equipment to clean them. Uh, I see some in, uh, uh, where I've got a building here in town, <clears throat> there's a gentleman who cleans probably two thirds of East North Street in the first block with a snowblower. Uh, there's other people living in that block that uh, there may be some that could do it and don't, but there's probably people living there that aren't able to do it or don't have the equipment for it. Um, the uh, <clears throat> last year, I think I think Marcus stated, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you you had gotten the new uh, Kubotas, are they? <coughs> or, uh, um, yeah, we have a, a new tractor with a new blower attachment and the V plow one uh, <clears throat> early last winter one with the uh, V plow couldn't be used because supposedly something had happened to it in uh, mowing grass and I th think there was a request for eight or ten thousand dollars for emergency repair to it but uh, I had saw that particular unit out and it was doing a super job so I thought that was odd, or it could have been another orange one with a V-plow doing the walks. But down across <clears throat> from my building near the county building, uh, actually next door to the county building <clears throat> was the snow from the street and sidewalk were being pushed into the sidewalk going north in front of the res residence north of uh, the resource center there. And uh, that was probably there a couple weeks. There was probably enough to fill one or two 10-yard dump trucks. And it was eventually had gotten large enough that it was out in the street. So the plows kind of went around it. Not intentionally, but as you run the blade along the bank, you follow the bank. But, uh, and I didn't happen to see it, but my wife came home one day and said she'd stop to uh, see if I was there. And uh, she said there was the V-plow down there trying to ram through that bank. And uh, I don't remember, she said he finally gave up, but she said she counted 14 times that he backed up and ran into it. And uh, that's not, not how you use equipment. I, I suppose it's his job to get that bank out of there. But somebody should have done something. Some people from the city, I think, use Lake Street quite often. That bank shouldn't have been left there for a couple weeks. And that may have been part of the problem with your V-plow, in addition to the grass damage in it. Um, and far as, um, I don't think you're looking at equal rights. I don't happen to live on uh, Chestnut Street over here, similar to the high school extension. Um, you've got people on one side of the street that are required to shovel their sidewalk people on the other side of the street aren't required to it. They can use their neighbors. They don't have to shovel it. And uh, Holly Road, <clears throat> if you're talking about safety, Holly Road is one of the, I believe, narrowest curb-to-curb -curb roads in the city, uh, other than maybe Beach Street or something. Um, and that's, I go down there in the winter, <clears throat> generally not plowing, but I go through that area. And uh, I'm not trying to 
put more work on Mr. Melema, but uh, that's very unsafe. You can barely pass two cars there in the winter, let alone have somebody walking that road. You got the wind blowing snow off the road or off the lake onto the road and bad visibility. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, the city should look at maybe, I think sidewalks in front of your home, you should pay to put them in under a special assessment. Uh, I think they should be on both sides of the street, not just one side. There's no reason that people on the north side pay and people on the south side don't pay. But it's uh, fairly clear, I think, uh, that it's the city's responsibility to plow those. <clears throat> and uh, as far as the tree lawns, I think most people wouldn't object to doing the tree lawns under normal circumstances. I happen to have an objection at one place I have. Uh, I do part of it. City does part of it, I guess. Uh, but, uh, and there's a lot of people don't mind shoveling the snow, because if, if you can shovel it as soon as it comes down, it's not packed down. But as far as not requiring people, say on Holly Road, where there's uh, sidewalk ends and it picks up, or maybe that's not one of them, but uh, it's probably no harder to shovel or snow blow over grass than it is packed down snow. And when you get in the city, you take your 40,000 pound trucks, and you go around the corner, and you take all your road snow and you put it on those T sidewalk intersections and you normally have snow probably close to three feet high, sometimes waist high, that's probably about three feet at my age. Uh, and that's, it's salted snow that's put on there and it's froze like a block of ice. And there's not a snowblower to go through it or anything else. And I, th I think by using a combination of your V plows, if you need one more V plow, those really make time. They're just, they drive, I don't know how fast they drive, but compared to the old uh, articulating snow blowers that they used that creeped along the street, these V plows uh, go right down the walks and do a really good job. They don't get it perfect, but it's a good job. And if you had somebody that took care of the snow at the corners, because that's not something that, uh, I do one church and I clear the corners of the front end loader, but that snow is frozen and there's no uh, no way you could do that with any normal piece of equipment. It's hey, nice Mr. when the Harvey, snow is we're going to have to move on. That's good. I, I see it wasn't limited, but it was requested, so yeah. thank you for the We time. appreciate your comments. Oh, good. No pen. My name's Awana Belterman. I live at 1523 Plett. Um, listening to your extensive way to advertise and to send, oh, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Pecchia, I was curious, how much is that, how much do you feel that that program's going to cost to inform everybody about the changes or what we have as far as, you know, your ad campaign? Did you have a cost figured for that? Um, I believe inserts in the utility bill, depending upon whether we're doing another one, at the same time might cost between two and four hundred dollars. I meant the whole thing, the putting stuff in the newspaper, the sending flyers out to people's homes. Uh, issuing a, a news release doesn't cost the city any money that's different than, uh, than taking But the flyers, I'm thinking, it, and where I'm going with this is like you've got the flyers, you've got this campaign, that campaign, you know, to put a sign here, some signs there, that's a lot of money. That's not counting the people that have to print those off that you're paying your staff to do. Why not just get another plow? I mean, that's our biggest impediment to me here in Cadillac is snow removal. Instead of putting $1,000, couple thousand dollars into this not everybody gets Facebook not everybody reads the newspapers mm -hmm. you know why not just go ahead and take care of the problem we pay taxes that's our biggest problem that hits this area is snow why can't a little different money be diverted or instead of spending it all on paper and time get them out there plowing just a thought Okay, seeing no one else, we'll go ahead and close uh, public comment for this hearing. 
and look for some input from council members. Are there ulterior motives for amending this to have people not have to plow their lawns? No, that was it. Okay, it isn't like we're gonna do this and then all of a sudden we're gonna start running out and writing tickets right away? Uh, no, no um, not at all. Okay, I know that um, where I live, I live where the sidewalk ends, up um, right by, yeah, I know, I love living where the sidewalk ends. But most of the front of my house is sidewalk and then it ends at my driveway. And um, we, my husband, for years, I can't do it. This is another question I want to ask about. But for years, my husband had a Uper scooper and got out there and, and did all that and kept things going. And, and then we got a snowblower. And I got to tell you, it isn't that it isn't more difficult to snow blow on your lawn, but it tears the heck out of it. I mean, you get, you've got a snow blower going in your lawn. So to have it where you're supposed to run your snow blower through your lawn so that people can walk on your lawn doesn't seem reasonable to me. So I think removing that is a good idea. In terms of it's, it's not been enforced, it is, you know, as, as neighbors, having it on there, everybody knows this is something we're supposed to do. It's like, you know, it's like, it's, I don't care, but, like, but um, so having it there, we need to, we need to, we can't do it all ourselves. We can't have it the city where the city plows all the sidewalks. Um, in the 60s, if they did it, I imagine there were fewer sidewalks that needed to be plowed in the 60s. I may be wrong, but I doubt it, um, cause between then and now. Also, budgets were very different then. We are, we are living under really, really tight budgets. They're continuously being squeezed from the state. In case you didn't know that, our dollars that go to the state are trickled back to us, and we do not get all that we put in from our property taxes. Only a portion of that comes back. So money is an issue. Um, a big concern that I have is that there are people who are not able to do their sidewalks. And I remember you mentioning something about some recruits that have to do some Yes. Business. So there's a place that if you need assistance, you can call and get assistance with your sidewalk. And it, it doesn't cost you. That if you're disabled or elderly and you need help with your sidewalk, we'll come out and do that. So this isn't designed to be a gotcha kind of thing. This isn't like, come on, people. We live up north. Let's keep our sidewalks clean. We want to get mail. We want to be able to get to, kids get to school. So I think that's what this is about. The change in the ordinance is to really make it a little less burdensome. And not, not for, I don't live on Holly Road, you know, I live over by Lincoln School. That's my ward, and there are a lot of my neighbors out there that don't have a sidewalk. And so this is not a, you know, we're trying to appease the 1% of Cadillac, if there is such a thing. This is something that is, um, it's a reasonable, change I think thank you well I would disagree with you that everybody knows they have to do it okay because I don't think they do and um, so I really appreciate that we're beefing up communications related to it and I don't think this advertising campaign or informational campaign is going to cost a lot if we use existing um, things like utility bill inserts we don't have to do a, an additional mailing for that and so on um, yeah I walk around places and I see big stretches that haven't been taken care of by the owner and and I would really appreciate that being done because the city sidewalk plow can't get to all of the streets. I also agree that that's probably a really good idea to do the main ones, um, but I see way too many people having to walk in the street because they can't walk on the sidewalk. So it's really encouraging to hear how many people think that our sidewalks should be plowed or should be maintained. And maybe that's something we can work towards eventually is having the resources or um, 
you know, putting those, uh, our limited resources, making this a priority. Um, and I can also appreciate why the city staff made the suggestion that we have to amend this ordinance. But I will tell you, there are places in this town where I understand why this ordinance was worded the way it was. I was telling Marcus, and I wish I'd taken a picture of it before the snow fell. And I was driving somewhere, and there I saw it. It was like a sidewalk ended, but people walked through there, and the whole area was was all dirt. It was a path. Um, and, I mean, that's a walkway, even though the side there's not concrete there. And, and I think that was the intention of this ordinance. Those natural walking areas that would be connect, you know, where other sidewalks <laughs> on each side of it. Um, but if it's going to make it easier to um, enforce or beef up the, the service that we have, I'll go along with the changing of the ordinance. The bottom line is, is we need more sidewalks. <laughs> yeah, there's that. That's the real thing. We do have, just as a sort of a quick fun fact, we do have a little over 50 miles currently that are maintained under this program. 50 miles, really? Yeah, I think it's about That's a lot. Three. Yep. Wow. Okay, okay I, um, I, I do have some points that I, I really think are important. I do want to mention, and I think it was brought out that you know, going back to March, the motion was, I did not support that motion, but the motion passed that we were going to direct the staff to develop a thorough communication and an enforcement plan. And the key, I know that was even brought, one council member noted that it's in our minutes. Last meeting, they supported amending the ordinance of eliminating that other section as it will assist the city in better enforcing the ordinance. So I do think it's important. There's also a section in that handout that's talking about it's a civil infraction. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's important to make sure we clearly state to the public this is more than just a communication program. Can I, We've can I just interject one thing, though, Councilmember Stevens, in, in full disclosure of that comment that you just made, in the question and answer portion, it says, what are the penalties if I don't clear my walk? And the response is, is that the city's code enforcement personnel will work with the responsible party to try for voluntary compliance. So it's not like as soon as... But what's the ne next sentence? If necessary, a ticket may be issued per city code. But that's not any different than what we currently have. But we also, initially, you, you addressed this, and I, I agreed with you at the time. You said, why well, have something we're not planning on enforcing. And that was the discussion last March, was we either need to get rid of it or enforce it. Yeah. So there was an emphasis of enforcing it. And um, I agree with one of the comments made that the enforcement would be, that aspect of it's not <coughs> gonna be, number one, it's gonna put a lot of, lot of stress on the staff. Secondly, we are, Mr. Petcha mentioned it in the program here, it mentions too, we're gonna operate it like the tall grass, so you get a complaint. Mm -hmm. Now the code enforcement person goes to that, that house, are they then supposed to just address that house? What if the whole block hasn't been shoveled? So now you've got that code enforcement, and I think the police department, want, they wanna do it fair. And so now, what are they doing? Just going to address the complaint? Or do they then start going house to house? Well, then at the end of that block, it continues. And uh, I think there's a lot of issues. I have had a tremendous amount of calls on this. One of them is a concern about if we're going to enforce it, it needs to be fair. This is going to be a really hard um, thing to enforce. Number one, people have asked good questions. You, you go out first thing in the morning at 6 a.m.? You do that citizen thing and you get that cover uncovered and we have a windy windy day so then at noon if the snow patrol comes by i i knew them as a band but now if we have the snow patrol go by at noon and it's drifted that person that had good intentions now i mean we don't have clear what should change if you're going to do the enforcement reasonable and practicable there's no definition 
and a lot of people are saying that. We, what's the clear, is it gonna be on certain times? Is it what's reasonable to one person may not be practical or reasonable to another? Um, we are, we're sitting in a situation where it's gonna be extremely hard for them to, uh, to do it in a fair basis. It's gonna put an extra load on our staff, which we're already into a situation. And, and I've mentioned this last March, I, I do three elderly neighbors yards now because they're so scared the the ones that are probably going to be most concerned about following the ordinance are going to be the seniors that are going to have a harder time doing that um, but I we've put a priority of sidewalks being cleared I think the citizens have talked about sidewalks needing to be cleared I then got to thinking um, we were addressed, I brought this up last year and it was brought up the other morning to this issues and solutions over coffee. We have that federal court case and the federal court case that came out in Holly. And, and I want to be very clear that one, while it was specific to tree lawns, I want to just read a s real quick section from and carefully reviewing the information presented to the court plaintiff's right upon which the ordinance allegedly infringes cannot be adequately distilled to simply whether or not plaintiff must mow the grass between the sidewalk and the curb. Instead, the ordinance infringes a much more fundamental right, the right not to be forced by a municipal government to maintain municipal property. They actually go into talking about how the United States was built upon the foundation of personal liberty and freedom from government intrusions. They reference another Supreme Court case that opinioned Indeed, in a free government, almost all their rights would become worthless if the government possessed an uncontrollable power over the private fortune of every citizen. I could go and read section after section where they're emphasizing the fact we're going to end up putting something that's not even going to be able to be really enforced. This, this court case by this federal court, I believe very seriously once somebody takes this, it's going to find that we do not have the power on public property to infringe this. And they're talking about how the 14th Amendment and the 4th Amendment supersede the ability um, to have to require this. Ironically, in this situation, they said in something that could be done by the city, which they proved by mowing grass, you're overtaking somebody's personal li liberties. Um, and they, f they specifically stated that ordinance was unconstitutional. So with all this said, <laughs> I then, on a different topic, had been looking at city properties just to see what we should do with all these empty lots, city properties that are owned by the city. You know, at some point, do we try to get them on ta the tax row, et cetera. As I was doing that, it dawned on me and I would like to pass along, there are four, really three pages of city-owned properties throughout the city. Now granted, somebody could argue and say not all of them have sidewalks, but a good share of them do. I started to map out and highlight, and I've, I didn't have time to finish. But what I started concluding is we have a lot of city-owned properties in the city. We, I do not think it's right of a government to impose on the citizens something we're not willing to do ourselves. And if we're going to tell the citizens, we, you have to shovel, we have an expectation, then we're going to obligate ourselves to having to make sure that every one of these properties, sidewalks, are cleared in the same manner. Now this was brought up at the issues over coffee and one of the staff mentioned, well, we do do that by our snow plowing of the sidewalks. But we also admit that we do that on, that would be at a different level we're expecting from the citizens of clearing their sidewalks. So it dawned on me, we're about solutions. I feel if we, if we did say we agree as a council that we can't impose on the public what we're not willing to do, we then, I feel, would be responsible to put in place a plan to make sure these properties are all taken care of in the same manner we're expecting the citizens. 
then you start saying, how are we going to do this? The first thing I came to, because I looked at Marquette, the best part of the conference is seeing Marquette, 44 inches of snow already, how they deal with their sidewalks is a good example. <coughs> but the conclusion is, if we're going to take care of our own properties, probably the best way to do that is through the snow plow, the, the sidewalk plow that we're using. And if you start coursing out all the properties we have, if we said we're going to make sure we're going to commit to the same thing we're putting the citizens, you start doing the pass, there's a good section of the city that could be done by them just plowing from one spot to the next. That would make more sense than putting snow blowers into pickups driving to each lot. So the final analysis, I, my alternative is that we, we just scrap that whole ordinance, we commit to this, and I know it would be some extra cost, but if we're going to do this, we're going to have to do it for ourselves. And once you start doing the path and start realizing a lot of the section of the city would be done by us taking care of our own lots, then maybe we just say we're going to just do the whole thing and have a plan in place um, <coughs> to go along with the priority that we have, that we want a walkable community and we want it clear. I just see that as more sensible than doing this proposal and um, at least to have an evaluation of I, I bet it doesn't end up costing us I know it, it's going to have an extra cost but I, I surely you know I don't know if Marcus will get the tickets if somebody puts it on the city for not doing it he's got a lot of properties he could get tickets on but we would have to put on ourselves the same obligation we're expecting the citizen and business owners to do it. so I would say let's not if we're going to get real, repeal it all and get a plan that we're going to just do it and um, put that as one of our priorities. Thank you. I would love to see us be able to do that, clear all the sidewalks um, throughout the city. But I really think we need to, I'm seeing Owen having a heart attack over there. Um, we would have to look at what that what the real cost would be because um, you know there I'm sure there are places where they where they do that and I wonder what the tax base is like and you know what I'm and saying then, you know and I, what I didn't bring up is we have even though we've pushed this for years we have not put ourselves at that expectation and so we're gonna have a walkable community that says on um, private owners sidewalks it's good and then we go we're going into a new era i think it's going to be very hard like i said even if we start doing tickets i think we're not going to get far with that and we should just start looking at you know what the communication plan is great the the emphasis to communicate i would rather see us focus the bigger issue with the snow block plowing is to enforce people that park over the sidewalks because then the the plows have to go into the road, go around that property to the next to get around. I appreciate that. That's a that part is of the communication. Right. Yeah. Now, to me, that's a reasonable expectation. But beyond that, I, I just think that uh, we should really see. This seems to be a goal. We focused on this for years. If this is really a goal of ours, then then we look and see how can we affect the budget. Have and do we that. ever had um, the hours here for our? sidewalk plow is from 7 to 3.30 during the day. Have we ever, based on anyone's knowledge, have we ever had like two shifts? We, um, just to, to, to clarify from the operational perspective, even that schedule, that's relatively new. Uh, in the past, uh, the sidewalk plow operator uh, was one of the um, snow plow truck uh, operators and the sidewalks weren't even addressed until after they were done with um, a plowing route or a salting route or whatever that particular person on that particular day that happened to also have the responsibility to operate the sidewalk plows. Uh, we're done doing it initially. Uh, last year uh, we did acquire a new tractor uh, and some new apparatus to attach to it um, to be able to try to uh, get through the city in a more efficient job. Our other equipment was very old was constantly breaking down 
and so we were able to, to have a more reliable source. Additionally, we brought in a seasonal person, again, an extra, uh, extra cost. Um, last season, but that approach worked better because now we were still able to keep our full uh, number of, um, of full-time uh, trained operators in the heavy equipment, uh, working on clearing the, the roadways and the alleyways and doing the salting and sanding that they need to do. And then in addition, we were able to have a seasonal worker just focusing on the sidewalks. What we're looking at doing uh, this season is staying with that and then possibly also tapping into some of our auxiliary folks, both uh, through the maybe police department and through the fire department, paid on call type people. Uh, we have some interest, um, uh, some small interest by a few of those folks. Uh, we also have uh, some small interest by a few folks in our utilities department that may be able uh, to help us with the second shift. And so we're. Uh, excited to see what this season, I should say winter, it's really more than just the season of winter, we're still in fall and we're going to be rolling that sucker out, uh, I believe, sometime soon. But we're looking Tomorrow. forward to seeing how, all right, to seeing how it, it works this time, well, especially is, if we are able to get some additional help. And is there an opportunity to move off one of the summer seasonal workers and put in a winter seasonal person instead? Well, I mean, we have a lot of seasonal workers during the summer, and I know that, you know, the, the financial issue is big, but can we do with one last person in the park in the summer and then have that person in the winter? We want to wanna be a four-season community. Yeah, we would need to look at that, because even as, as I hate to say, I think we all know that even in the summer and the fall, there's just a tremendous amount of work trying to keep keep things up. Well, I know, but right now we're not addressing the winter need at all. Well, this much. But there's obviously much more need for winter um, snow removal. And we've got well, more resources during the summer. So. And one of the advantages when we went to that seasonal employee, it, it saved uh, an overtime person at yes. time and a half at a higher wage where we have a seasonal employee. Right, and if we stayed with seasonal, I would imagine there's people out there who would like to work. Yeah. I, so maybe that's an option. I mean, if, it, if, it, it if it's be, a financial, it, it. and of course we'd have to have the equipment. But. Do we? Yeah. Do we have only one sidewalk plow at this point? We do have two units. Um, one is our older one, and one is our newer one. Um, okay. So, uh, but we do have two units currently. Because to like hit, I would just do a little. They'd have to go to hit all 50 miles in like seven hours or so. They'd have to be going almost 10 miles an hour, and that ain't going to happen. Actually, it takes to, to hit the whole city um, with the V plow, it does take two days to three days. Mm -hmm. And that is that varies really depending upon weather conditions, you know, depending upon how much snow then falls during that period of time. When we use the snowblower attachment, it takes even longer. Uh, because of the speed at which um, you're able to operate using the V-plot. Right. The speeds are, are slow to begin with. You have to be obviously very careful when you're doing it mm -hmm. uh, from the get-go, regardless of what attachment you're using. Uh, but with respect to the um, with respect to the blower attachment, it, it slows the whole process down. But if we were able to double up on the time that we're giving it now, we're giving it a full-time person, 7 to 3.30, and if we put another seasonal person in there, we're going to double those efforts, and I can't mm -hmm. believe that we wouldn't see a huge amount of improvement in what we're offering. I think you're right. And maybe, you know, talking about the MML conference, I mean, this was just went in my head, but um, maybe we could crowdfund another V-plow. I mean, if the people in the, in the community want to have the city do this job, would they be willing to do like a you know a GoFundMe type thing to buy us buy another sidewalk plow so that then we could we could do that and there's there's this is a new law in Michigan that um, you can crowdsource crowdfund um, municipal projects so maybe that would be something wouldn't that be kind of cool and have mm -hmm. then instead of you know having an ordinance with all this toothless teeth and 
all this other kind of stuff. Then we could ask people, ask, you know what I'm saying, where there's teeth, but we don't use them. You know, we put them in the glass at night. Um, the, <laughs> the, maybe then, instead of having an ordinance with, you know, civil infraction, we just ask people to help us out. So if it's blowing, come on, get out there and help clear, clear this, clear your walks. But meanwhile, we maybe even can I? Uh, May I make a motion? Yes. I don't know. Depends what it is. No. <laughs> You'd be great. I just want to move on. <laughs> well, if it moves us on, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution to adopt the ordinance to amend Section 3677 of the Cadillac City Code, snow and ice removal. And then look into alternatives as we go. So this is just a start. Do we need to do that? That's my motion. That's the motion. And we are always free to do that to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a reasonable change, so I'll support that. I, for me, you know, I think we continue to monitor this. I really appreciate everybody wanting to do this and working together on it. But it, yeah, it's going to require monitoring. By removing this particular piece from the ordinance shouldn't prevent us from moving forward to address this issue. This is, this is, um, this is making it easier because it's, it's taking out that piece that's hard to define. I just think uh, I was about to ask earlier about whatever, whatever we were doing and how we were doing it last December, early January, if you recall, we were getting compliments. <laughs> Whatever, we changed the plan, we got that new plow, we got the, the workers, and it was working. Mm -hmm. And then something happened after that. But I would really Six like us to so? see, well, that was one of the <laughs> issues. <laughs> sure. yeah. uh, 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 a, a biblical uh, snowfall was, last year. <laughs> if you remember, we had some early yeah. ones, and people yeah. came in complimenting us mm -hmm. to how we right. dealt. Okay. But you're right. I mean, with that, you're not going to get any, any expectation of that. But my point is, is we were doing something really good there, and then it stopped. And I don't remember if that was because of the it breaking down or what occurred. But um, you know, with, with Councilmember Shippers, what you were talking about, I like that concept um, of doing some other options. But yeah, this the fact of the matter is, is this going to start enforcing, and we're going to put some extra burden on our police staff and time to uh, go after the snow patrol instead of other things, and that's what's cautioning me about this motion. The motion, though, has nothing to do with enforcement. It just takes away the... It doesn't change following. anything about uh, of your what was in there, yeah. what has always been in there. <clears throat> well, except for we're including that whole enforcement package there that's included with it. The communication package? Are you calling that an enforcement package? No. It includes the enforcement, yes. Yes, it does. So that communication thing isn't what the amendment is, though. That's just something that we do every year. We send out a notice about cleaning your sidewalks. Right. The same, pretty much the same one. Okay, we really need to move on. Okay. Um, Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Spoolman. Yes. Stevens. No. Alama. Shippers. Yes. Mayor Falcon. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Let's look into. Okay, the else? next thing on our agenda is appointments. And Sandy. Uh, yes, uh, Roy Wolford uh, resigned as chairman of the Maple Hill Cemetery Board at the meeting on October 13th. And there's a recommendation to appoint Thomas Olmstead as chairman, replacing Roy for a term to expire on 117 of 2015. So just to finish out his term. So now we have 14 openings for volunteers. Well, he's because is is um, Wolford on. already on there? Oh, he's not on there. Olmstead okay. is not on. There. Okay. All right. Or uh, Olmstead, I apologize. It's interesting that it's only for 2 months. He's filling a term. And then, and then we'll have a new appointment at that after that. Is that? I yes. know we talked about this when we. Okay. Is, that, is that committee 
They actually, we appoint the chairman versus the committee and themselves, or is it? Do you happen to have that? It must be because he's filling his position. This board just needs to meet. Or we just are appointing the position and the committee will determine its new chair. I honestly don't know the answer to that offhand. I'd have to look at, at our board and commission book. Um, well, it says to the but, position of chairman. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we just yeah. change that to appoint them and, and, they can and leave that as if, because uh, I have a feeling that committee chooses their chair and he just happened to be the that's, chair. That's likely the case. I'm not familiar with the council ever. So the chair before, you're so. proposing just make a motion to approve the appointment of Thomas Ol Olmstead to the cemetery board. Yeah, and I, in, in making that motion too, I, Roy Wol Wolford served on that board for 40 years. Is it? I think he he just got recognized for 40 years, 40 years. serving wow. on that committee. So in the that? in the fact of um, him resigning, mm -hmm. I think it should be noted in a big thank you to Mr. Wolford for his 40 years of service. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to make a motion that we fill that vacancy with uh, Thomas Olmstead for a term of January 17, 2015 to replace Roy Wolford on the um, Maple Hill Cemetery Board. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Malama, Shippers? Yes. Woman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Mayor Falker? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we have city manager's report. Um, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. This first item is with respect to the signing of a public alley uh, located on the east side of Mitchell Street between Harris and Cass Streets. And our development director, Jerry Adams, is going to give the quick rundown. There's also a picture on the uh, screens. You only have the one slide, so I don't need the clicker. <laughs> um, real quickly, we weren't uh, staff reviewed this request, uh, which I'll go over in just a second. We weren't sure really if it needed a city council decision or not, but nonetheless, we decided to bring it to you as a policy decision. But um, the aerial photo uh, shows the the yellow arrow uh, arrow there, and uh, to the uh, to the left that main street there, that's Mitchell. You, then you have, as you go east, you have the row of commercial buildings, the alley, and then just to the east of the alley is the post office, and to the south of the post office is the drive-through area for uh, Fifth Third Bank. Essentially what we're dealing with here, that alley um, has a, um, a design width, uh, on paper at least, of 12 feet. Functionally, because of various encroachments and so forth, it really has, a, it functions at about maybe 10 and a half to 11 feet. Uh, and as such, it is a one-way, it's signed right now as a one-way alley. You can enter it from Harris, which would be on the north, uh, traveling south, and you would exit uh, at Cass Street. And the alley uh, essentially doesn't serve any public parking lots or any other uh, parking areas. Uh, it largely functions to uh, serve as a loading-unloading zone for the businesses uh, just to the, uh, just to the uh, west. Uh, those businesses could load or unload, I suppose, on Mitchell, but really it, it's, uh, it's really not conducive to that, um, and we prefer that they don't. And anyways, um, the, uh, the question or, or what has surfaced over, over the years, and it doesn't happen too often, but what will happen is a business, for example, will go through the alley, uh, need to, let's say, unload merchandise, and maybe it's only going to take five or ten minutes, and then uh, typically someone wants to, someone not associated with local business wants to uh, go through the alley, or they go through the alley, they're blocked. And uh, once in a while some verbal uh, uh, confrontation occurs, fortunately no fisticuffs yet. But uh, um, essentially uh, there's really not a need for this particular alley from the standpoint as a through passageway. Uh, you have again to the uh, to the west, very very close. You have got Mitchell Street, less than 200 feet away, and then to the uh, to the east you have uh, Shelby, uh, which is a two-way system. So anybody wanting to go north south 
can easily find alternative routes without any any problem. Um, what's been requested by one of the merchants is, is it possible to sign the alley, not prohibit anyone from going through it, but sign it such uh, with something like this. You know, this alley is used for loading and unloading. It's not for through traffic. Doesn't mean you still can't go through it. Uh, and this may not be the exact wording, but we just want to alert folks to the fact that uh, a business along the way uh, may use it for loading and unloading, at least for a, a short temporary period of, uh, of time. Staff looked at a number of issues or, or a number of factors as to why we believe this is appropriate. Um, as mentioned, unlike a majority of our alleys, this particular alley doesn't serve uh, or provide any access to a public or private parking lot. Uh, there is the lot at the end, the Fifth Third Bank lot, but that uh, uh, that uh, parking lot is accessed uh, via uh, Shelby Street. Um, I mentioned about the proximity of the two nearby streets that are, are very close. They provide ease of access from north uh, to southbound or southbound to northbound uh, type of movement. The average daily traffic counts along this alley are really minimal. Uh, probably at most, you're looking at about 50 trips or 50 vehicles per day. Per day, that's that's essentially nothing. <laughs> and most of those trips, by the way, are uh, vehicles associated with loading and unloading. Uh, fourthly, um, as uh, mentioned, there is the the fifth third parking area and the drive-through windows on the south end. Signing uh, this particular alley as we would like uh, would not have any effect or impact uh, on the bank, so that's not a not an issue. And again, if somebody wanted to still go through the alley, uh, they could uh, still do so. We did uh, ask the DDA. We went to the DDA and asked if they had any uh, any concerns with respect to signing it, letting people know that uh, there may be vehicles loading or unloading, and they did not have an issue at all. So what we're asking is for permission to. Uh, to sign the alley, that would be at the uh, Harris Street intersection. Again, with, and we don't really have the, the final wording yet, but something to indicate that the alley is used for loading and unloading, just to alert people so that uh, they may think twice before they go through it. Any questions? I think that sounds like a great idea. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the signing of the public alley as presented. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Shippers? Yes. Bullman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Malama? Mayor Falcon? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, um, Mayor, members of the City Council. This next item uh, is with respect to the award of bids for well installation and aquifer testing. Um, this part of our project deals with uh, water quality and quantity uh, with respect to the phase two development of our wellfield relocation project. Uh, no site has been chosen yet. Uh, but this award will allow the project to continue to move forward. Uh, we did receive four bids as follows, one from Raymer Company out of Marne, Michigan, uh, one from Perilous Midwest out of Ionia, Michigan, one from Pearson Drilling Company out of Lake City, Michigan, and one from Ed Berkmeyer Well Drilling out of North Lothrop, Michigan. Um, the bids are based on estimated quantities and depths. Uh, the final cost of the project will vary uh, based on final actual quantities, but unit prices uh, will not change. Uh, based, uh, based upon the unit prices that were, that were bid, uh, the recommendation this evening uh, is to go uh, with Raymer Company uh, in accordance with their bid. Uh, funds are available in our water and sewer fund, and the cost of the project will be eligible for loan funding assuming that we're successful in attaining our funds uh, through the State of Michigan Drinking Water Revolving Fund Program. I did have a question. When you come, the unit price, that uh, somewhat makes sense, but basically we won't know until the certain property in terms of depth and for that specific property? Correct. Similar to when we buy salt, you know, mm -hmm. asphalt sometimes it's based on the unit price, but we don't know until the project <coughs> is actually done what that total will be. So these are these are estimates. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brent. Any other questions? Could we have a motion? 
seems interesting that this is done before we know what the site is. Is that normal? Uh, we're just trying to streamline a little bit so when we do finally pick a parcel, we can jump right on it and start with the uh, drilling. So when so. you the bid sheets out or when they bid, they bid for, and it's good for a certain period of time that would accommodate yes. that? Uh, yes, and, and, and you have to remember we already did a kind of a pre, um, pre um, aquifer testing when we put the smaller walls down so we know approximately all the depths are approximately the same and and that's why we we just took a what would fit most of them said this is the depth and what would it cost us now as mr stevens as uh, council member stevens says uh, if it changes and it's 15 feet deeper or shallower that price is going to change but So that the re the one of the reasons I ask that then is for this motion, um, we're not necessarily uh, given a dollar amount versus the company, with a because we don't know if that's gonna which way that's gonna go. That's correct. Um, if I may, just suggest I would suggest uh, a motion to award the contract for well installation and aquifer testing to Rainbow Company in accordance with your bid. I make a motion that we um, approve the recommendation to award the contract for the well insulation and aquifer testing to Raymer Company in accordance with their bid and unit prices. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Spoolman. Yes. Stevens? Yes. Alma? Shippers? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes. <coughs> well, normally it talks about where the funding's going to come from for it. You know, I mean, for it, it would be contingent water. on us receiving that um, DWRF funding. And you're absolutely right. You're shaking your head no? No. You got to drill the well first, and then you reimbursed, you're reimbursed by DWRF, so... Um, you know, there's a possibility uh, to put in the application. You need that information, so the drop. You know, y you you're on the hook for that, and then you reimbursed once you get the funding, but, or, or okay. once you. So apply. the funding comes out of the water and sewer fund. Right. Correct. Okay. Okay. The next thing on the agenda is uh, introduction of ordinances and resolutions. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, this next item is the request to set a public hearing for December 15th, 2014 with respect to the amending of our city zoning map uh, for property located along the east side of Mitchell Street uh, between, between the United States Forest Preserve Office uh, and the High Point uh, Cadillac GMC automobile uh, dealership. Uh, Jerry? I just have a couple of slides. Um, <laughs> no. It's off, Jerry. I guess is that we better do this because they've already started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, want those, we want those surgeons in Kettle. This will be quick uh, because tonight you're just being asked to set a public hearing, so you'll get a fuller presentation at the at the next meeting. Um, the uh, the parcel that we're dealing with is, is uh, Marcus mentioned, you can see the, the green square, so to speak. Uh, to the north of that square is the U.S. Forest Service offices. Uh, to the south is uh, High Point, uh, which really is in, uh, is in Clam Lake Township, and then south of that is, uh, is Van Dries Furniture. But uh, this piece of property is in the city. It's a piece of property that's been vacant for a number of years, uh, kind of an exciting project on the works. Uh, the applicant is uh, Reamer Real Estate Investment, Dr. Reamer, uh, whose headquarters or offices are, are located in Ludington, Michigan. Uh, Dean DeCrager from the DK Design Group is the project architect, and Dean will be here at the next meeting uh, to talk a little more fully about the project. Uh, he's also the, uh, the representative, so to speak, for Dr. Reamer. The request that's uh, being sought is they would like to rezone the site from Tourist Service 1, which is a commercial classification, 
uh, to B3 general business, as mentioned, both, dis both districts are already commercial. The issue is that the T1, TS1 classification is almost wholly or essentially is associated with tourism uses, whereas the B3 provides uh, for a broader range of uh, general business uses. And uh, Dr. Reamer is hoping to, or is planning to build a new medical facility uh, on this site, at least the northern, uh, northerly portion of the site. And uh, the current zoning ordinance would not allow, or would not, will not allow this particular development to happen. So that's why the rezoning is being sought. It's kind of exciting, I believe. Then uh, he'll be looking at developing the southern two-thirds of this parcel uh, in the future. So uh, an opportunity for the city. Uh, Planning Commission. I did hold a public hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, on this uh, and made a motion to recommend approval of the rezoning of the site to B3. Uh, they felt that the B3 district was compatible with surrounding land uses and zone district classifications. It was uh, number two, consistent with the city master plan. Uh, thirdly, uh, that existing public facilities and services that are either uh, present at the site or nearby are capable of accommodating uh, the uses permitted by the, the B3 classification. Uh, the Planning Commission found the proposed B3 is equal to the existing classification, that TS classification, in terms of appropriateness to the area. And uh, they also found that the character surrounding development uh, is consistent with the range of uh, a B3 uses. And so tonight, you're being asked to adopt a, a resolution, which you have, to introduce an ordinance submitting the city zoning map from TS1 Tourist Service District to B3. Uh, general business for the following described property, which I will not read, <laughs> but uh, you you have it in your in your packet, and I believe that's the extent. Yes. <coughs> Any questions? Okay. There'll be a fuller presentation next time, yeah. or when this comes up. Thank you. I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution to, to introduce ordinance amending the city zoning map and to set a public hearing for December 15, 2014. I'll support that. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Stevens? Yes. Alma? Shippers? Yes. Coleman? Yes. Mayor Falcon? Yes. Motion carries. <coughs> and then we have adoption of ordinances and resolutions. Um, thank you, Mayor, members of the uh, City Council. This next item is with respect to uh, Spencer Plastics request for an industrial facilities tax exemption certificate in the amount of $467,426. This will assist with the acquisition of new equipment and a building addition. Uh, this evening we're here to set the public hearing for December 1st, 2014. I have a question about the application. Normally these have the um, number of jobs at the facility that will be retained and or the number of new jobs at the facility if we grant this and this lists neither. We can try to get that information or we will get that information for the public hearing because I don't I don't see it either and I don't see it in the um, and then Mr. The yeah Mr. Thiebel too has a history of attending those too, which would be good because we could get that from them. then. This is also, which is neat, is if you remember, we did some transfers of this as they moved into the city. This is actually new, mm -hmm. which is exciting. But I'd like to make a motion that we set the public hearing for December 1st, 2014 to consider the proposed request from Spencer Plastics Incorporated for the industrial facilities tax exemption in the amount of $467,426. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Malama, Shippers? Yes. Bowman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Mayor Falcon? Yes. Motion carries. Mayor, members of the City Council, this next item is the one that we had added mm -hmm. in the beginning of our, yep. of our meeting this evening. Um, uh, this is again with respect to an industrial facilities tax exemption certificate uh, and to set a public hearing for December 1st. Uh, this company is Avon Automotive. They are looking at a certificate valued at $1,330,565. Uh, 
uh, for the purposes of acquiring new equipment uh, to remain competitive in the automotive industry as their application indicated. Additionally, uh, their application does indicate it will help with the retention of 492 positions. Wow. Well then, that's a keeper. I'll make a motion <laughs> to adopt a resolution and set a public hearing for December 1st, 2014 to consider request from Avon Automotive for an industrial facilities tax exemption certificate in the amount of $1,330,565. Mm -hmm. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Shippers? Yes. Coleman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Alma? Mayor Falcon? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, then we do have on our agenda the minutes of boards and commissions uh, from uh, the Cadillac Planning Commission, the Wexford County Airport Authority, the Downtown Development Authority, and the Dog Park Advisory Committee for our uh, reading pleasure. Um, at this time, we'll open the floor for public comments. Again, if you would limit public comment to three minutes, it would be greatly appreciated. No, you're thinking, oh no, here he comes again. No. <laughs> but really, Rich Harris, uh, Air Street and Kedley. You brought out a good point, uh, Council Member Shippers, about the the snow plowing and snow plowing. Um, and I guess my question would be like the um, snowmobile trails, they get volunteers to do that. I don't know what the legality or what the liability would be to the city, but would there be a potential that, you know, maybe you could get people to sign up and, you know, take a couple hour shift in the plow or, a, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, legitimately or not or not, but just food for thought, you know, when you're talking about getting people to step up and help, help to do the thing. Another fun fact is when you had that thing up there just a minute ago about where Reamer wants to put their thing, does anybody know what used to be up there? That was an old sand golf course. Used to be called JD's. Am I showing my age or? Oh. It would be behind the forestry building and up in that area. Cool. I did not know that. My name's Kathleen Mary Williams, and uh, I just wanted to ask a couple questions. What do one of those snow plows cost the city about? 30? 35,000. Thirty-five thousand. Is there are some winter fest program coming up or something that we could run a raffle to maybe buy one of them well? And, and that way the city would actually have to pay for all their funds. And if you had another one, I don't know how many, I can't imagine how much one snow fell from covering the sidewalks in Cadillac. That, that um, doesn't sound like it would probably be able to cover maybe a fourth of our area. Would that be about right? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Kathy? Um, one snowmobile, or one of the drivers on the snow plows, do they cover about a fourth of the city in one day, or? It really depends on the conditions, the heaviness of the snow, what type of attachment they're using, so it... Well, what sorry. I was thinking, if we could run a, uh, something through one of these snow things that we have that people like to go to. Maybe you could raise the funds for one from that, and then it would give another person a job. But it was just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, seeing no one else at this time, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Which takes us to the good of the order. And we'll go ahead and start with Council Member Stevens. I, um, I did a pretty good share of talking during the meeting. I'm pretty good tonight. Okay. 
<clears throat> Same here. Um, I hope that there's been a lot of, of bad um, feeling, a lot of people's feelings hurt, um, a lot of like friendships and and acquaintances that have become strained because of the things that have been going on lately. There's there's vehemence, there's accusations, there's all kinds of things. And I would hope that that we could start moving forward together. I like hearing about let's find a way to get another plow together. That's a start. There's so many things that we could do when we work together across the great divide, across the political divide. So I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll be very brief. Just wanted to mention that uh, although uh, we're still in fall, and yes, we do have our snow, and we ask everybody to be careful and, and cautious of pedestrians and motorists alike. Um, we are still hoping for yet another ribbon cutting ceremony to, to take place before this year's end, uh, sooner versus later. Information will be coming out as soon as I have it with respect to the uh, first uh, milestone being accomplished on the Rotary uh, Pavilion renovation project. Uh, the new restroom facilities are just about done. Uh, we had to wait uh, for some uh, special flooring and, and windows. Uh, my understanding is that that's happening this week, and we'll get a date out there. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, really, all I have this evening was to uh, share that I had the opportunity, along with several others, to participate in the annual thank you lun luncheon for the volunteers who serve on the various boards uh, within the city, and we had a wonderful time of fellowship. And there are a lot of amazing volunteers that help out with the things that need to be done in our community. Um, earlier I said we had uh, some opportunity if uh, there are folks out there who would like to give of their time and their talents. And currently we have 13 uh, opportunities for you to volunteer on some of those different committees. So I would encourage people to uh, either stop down at the city and ask about those, or you can go online and find that information as well. And that's all I have for this evening. So at this time, we are going to adjourn to closed session to discuss pending litigation regarding AutoZone versus the city of Cadillac. And we would like to invite Joe Porterfield, who is the city assessor, to join us. Sorry. So, okay. So do we need to make a motion for that? Yes. I'll make that motion. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Spolman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Melama? Shippers? Yes. Mayor Falcons? Yes. to make a motion to get us back into open session while they sit down? I'll make a motion that we return to open session. Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Malama? Shippers? Yes. Bowman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Mayor Falcon? Yes. Marcus? Um, Mayor, members of the City Council, at this time I can report um, that with respect to the current Michigan Tax Tribunal case um, 451305 AutoZone versus City of Cadillac, it would be recommended that we enter into a stipulation agreement that would include a $60 per square foot assessment for 2013, a $55 square foot assessment for 2014, uh, both on the condition that AutoZone waives all interest in any refund, uh, and the suggested motion at this time would be to authorize the city attorney uh, to enter into that stipulation agreement accordingly regarding the AutoZone versus City of Cadillac, Michigan Tribunal tax case.
451305. But you have to repeat the whole thing. Word for word. I'll make that motion. <laughs> <laughs> Support. Sandy, could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Shippers? Yes. Bowman? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Malama? Mayor Falcons? Yes. Motion carries. At this time, we're going to adjourn the meeting.